All right. Welcome. Good morning to those who have morning. Good evening to those who have evening now. I am from Berlin, actually Potsdam University. I'm the chair of this session. The se session which we have today is a very interesting subject, as a lot of them. Syntax, case, and agreement. And uh, we have three speakers. All of them will have 20 minutes time for speaking and 10 minutes for discussion. Welcome to all who are participating here. And we we'll start right now with the first talk by Emily Drummond from University of California, Berkeley, entitled Syntactic Ergativity Without Morphological Ergativity. Double point, an argument for abstract case. Thank you so much. And you are already ready. So here we go. Thank you so much. Um, so today I'll be talking about ergativity. Um, thank you first for coming to the first session and the first talk of the day. Um, so I'm gonna start off uh, with the central question, um, which is the relationship between morphological and syntactic ergativity, right? That's in the title. So I'm gonna start by defining some terms. Um, morphological ergativity uh, refers to the overt expression of an ergative alignment in a language's case or agreement system. Um, so we see a case system in one with West Greenlandic where transitive subjects are distinguished uniquely um, on nominals themselves. And we can also see this in agreement as well. Um, so this is the case in many Mayan languages, for instance, um, where verbal agreement distinguishes transitive subjects, um, but not necessarily on the nominal itself. By contrast, syntactic ergativity uh, is manifested in syntactic operations such as A-bar movement. Um, and I'm gonna be using that term specifically to refer to uh, restrictions on A-bar movement here. Um, and we see this in West Greenlandic in three, um, where we can relativize an absolutive argument, no problem with an unmarked gap. Um, but if we try to do the same thing with an ergative argument, we get ungrammaticality. We have to do some kind of other mechanism um, to relativize an ergative subject. So in Dixon's work on ergativity, he uh, makes a claim about the typology of the relationship between these two um, and states that all languages with syntactic ergativity are morphologically ergative as well. And this gives us the typology uh, here in table one. And we have a missing uh, cell in the typology. So we don't have a language where we have syntactic ergativity, but a morphologically non-ergative system. And this includes systems that are overtly accusative or a neutral case um, and agreement. So from this typology, it seems like morphological ergativity is a necessary precondition for syntactic ergativity. But if we look at generative theories of case and syntactic ergativity, it's not really clear why this typology should hold. Um, and this is for two reasons. One is that analyses of syntactic ergativity typically rely on abstract case in some way. And the second assumption is that abstract case need not be realized morphologically. And if we put those two things together, we get a theoretical prediction that we should find a language with syntactic ergativity and a neutral alignment, so no alignment in morphological case or agreement. And in this talk, I'm going to show that this prediction is upheld in Nguoro, a Polynesian outlier language of Micronesia. Um, and we can revise Dixon's generalization just slightly to capture the Nguoro pattern and say that abstract ergativity is the necessary precondition for syntactic ergativity. And this aligns much better with generative theories of case and ergativity. Um, so in this way, the Nguoro pattern provides an additional argument for abstract case and also has some implications for the learnability of abstract categories. So as a roadmap, I'll take you through some background and take a quick detour to Mayan. Um, then we'll look at the Nuguoro case study. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, identifying abstract alignment and some challenges, uh, and then we'll look at implications. So first, some background. Um, first, modern generative syntax generally assumes a distinction between abstract and morphological case, right? This goes all the way back to the case filter from Chomsky, um, where abstract case is syntactic, it's obligatory for nominal licensing, and then morphological case is more surface level. It's built on abstract case. Um, it appears later in the derivational pathway. And the insertion of case morphemes is generally thought to be subject to morphological principles such as the elsewhere condition, um, where you can get a single morpheme that might realize multiple abstract cases, or you could have an abstract case that might have no suitable vocabulary item. And if this is true of all cases in a language, if all of them are covert, 
then that language can be said to have abstract case without morphological case or agreement. Um, so turning to syntactic ergativity, um, nearly all theories, generative theories of syntactic ergativity rely on abstract case in some way. Um, and this can be done through abstract case discrimination, or it can be analyzed as a byproduct of uh, ergative or absolutive case assignment mechanisms. And the reason why this is, is because syntactic ergativity is really a property of operations. Um, so most people attribute this to the operation itself, such as the features that it can reference or the structure that it operates on. And in a sense, the morphological realization of abstract case just occurs too late in the derivation to cause a syntactic problem. So here we get a mismatch between Dixon and the theory, right? So the theory predicts that any language with abstract case could show syntactic ergativity, even if that case isn't realized morphologically. And to demonstrate that this prediction is true, um, I'm going to zoom in on syntactically ergative Mayan languages, such as Khan Kobal, um, which are purely head marking and don't show case marking on nominals. So we can see this in four, um, where the man appears in both absolutive and ergative position and is unmarked for case, right? We see the ergative alignment only in the agreement paradigm. And one particular account of syntactic ergativity, just as an example, um, argues that the object systematically shifts over the subject, preventing further A-bar movement of the subject. And this is a standard analysis. Um, and we see this here in five. So we get object shift um, and absolute of case assignment from infill or T. Um, and this essentially traps the subject in a lower phase. Um, it occupies the only escape hatch for an argument and the subject can no longer move further. And the core claim here is really that syntactic ergativity is directly tied to absolute of case assignment from T. So this object shift is driven by a need for case licensing. Um, if we assume that case assignment can't cross the little VP phase, the object must move to the specifier of that phase to escape and receive case from T. Um, and it is the same object movement that then prevents subject movement, right? So the two are inherently linked. And the implication underlying this is that Mayan languages assign abstract ergative and absolute of case, but don't realize it ever on nominals. Um, so in a sense, Mayan languages only satisfy Dixon's generalization by having overt verbal agreement that follows an ergative alignment. And nothing in the theory requires this agreement to be overt. Um, and we really need to go that one step further to get a language with syntactic ergativity, but no morphological ergativity at all. And if we don't find such a language, right, if Dixon's typology is correct, um, I argue that we need to change the theory in one of two ways. We need to explain that gap. We can either say that abstract case must be realized somewhere on heads or dependents, um, or we could say that syntactic operations directly reference morphological marking. Um, and here I'm going to argue that neither of these revisions is necessary, um, and we can actually fill the gap in the typology with Nukuoro. Okay, so let's look at the data. Um, in this section, I'm going to argue two things separately. One is that Nukuoro has no ergative case or agreement. And two, that Nukuoro shows an extraction restriction on transitive subjects. Um, and so Nukuoro is a Polynesian outlier language of Micronesia. It's spoken by about a thousand people. Um, it has basic SVO word order, though it was historically VSO. Um, and it has no morphological case except the genitive. Um, and all of the data here comes from primary fieldwork in Pohnpei, Micronesia. So the first claim um, is that though historically ergative, modern Nukuoro does not show ergativity in case or agreement. So if we look at the Polynesian outliers, um, many of them only mark ergative case on post-verbal pronominal subjects. And we see this here in six for Kapinga Marangi, which is very closely related to Nukuoro, um, and in seven for Tubaluan, where the ergative marker is either a or ne. And if we look at the historical record for Nukuoro, um, we see that the same was true. So narratives from the early 1960s, which are published, um, show a few instances of ergative marking, but only on these post-verbal pronouns. Um, so we see this in eight and nine, that the ergative marker is a um, in Nukuoro as well. But when I ask modern speakers about this ergative marking, um, it will only be accepted or offered in post-verbal contexts as the older or more proper way of speaking. Um, so from speaker commentary, it's very clear that no living Nukuoro speakers would use this marking. 
and that the last generation that would use this marking was at least one generation above the oldest living speakers. Um, so I provided a sentence like in 10, where we have this ergative marking. And my consultant says on one day, um, yes, the older people, that would be their way of speaking, his grandparents. Um, and on a different day, I think a year later, um, my grandmother and people before her would say this, my mother and people younger would say goi. Um, so they're clearly recalling an earlier form of the language. Um, but when I get them to produce sentences through a translation task, for instance, um, if a postverbal subject is licit, so in polar questions, um, they appear unmarked. And this is true across the board. Um, so nedanga goi thing get they did you weave the baskets where you is unmarked. And Modern Nukuworo doesn't really allow postverbal subjects in many contexts. Polar questions is really the only one. Um, so in declarative transitive clauses, you can't do a postverbal subject at all with or without ergative marking. Um, and we see that in 12 or 13. And in SVO declarative clauses, which are by far the most basic clause type, um, there is no case marking on pronominal arguments. As we see in 14, we see au, the first singular pronoun, unmarked in all three positions. We can't add a onto that preverbal subject. Um, and the same is true of full DPs. So we can't say um, the gaudiki, the child, in ergative position. We can't add an ergative case marker there. And finally, just turning to agreement quickly. Nukuoro doesn't really have canonical verbal agreement, so that's out. Um, we do see a subset of intransitive verbs that show something like participant number marking um, using reduplication or suppletion. So we see this here in 16 with the geminate uh, initial S here, marking the plurality of the intransitive subject. Um, but this really only applies to a subset of intransitive verbs. Um, so we don't see an ergative alignment in agreement either. So there's our first generalization. Um, that Nukuwaro does not, modern Nukuwaro does not have ergative case or agreement. So the second claim is that Nukuwaro shows syntactic ergativity um, in relativization. And uh, here I'll show that transitive subjects can't be relativized using an unmarked gap strategy. Instead, we get passive voice morphology on the verb to obviate this restriction. So a quick primer on the passive. Um, Nukuoro passive used the very famous Polynesian sia suffix, um, along with the postverbal particle ina, which is historically derived from the same uh, suffix. Um, so we see this in 17, where we have a very English-like passive, Johnny built my house. Um, and if we want to passivize, we promote the object, we demote the subject, and we get this passivized form of the verb, hakaduria ina, um, with the suffix and this particle in that as well. So the primary A-bar movement strategy in Nukuoro is relativization. Um, Nukuoro uses a genitive relative clause, which marks the subject of the relative clause with genitive case. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but if we look at how we relativize different types of arguments, absolutive arguments can be relativized using an unmarked gap in base position. So we see this in 18. Um, who is dancing? We get an unmarked gap in that absolutive position. Um, or who did Ruth hit, uh, it's the same thing. So we can just use an unmarked gap. But if we try to do the same thing with a transitive subject, it's ungrammatical. So I can't say Sony, who hit Johnny, where I just leave a gap there. Instead, I need to put passive morphology on the verb. Um, so I need to say ina Sony, and this is the same passive morphology um, from the, the true passive construction. And it's worth noting that voice morphology is a very common cross-linguistic strategy to obviate an ergative extraction restriction. So this follows um, the typological pattern. Um, and lastly, the restriction only targets ergative subjects, not just agents. Um, so only syntactically transitive verbs can relativize with ina. Um, ina, you can't just stick it on any subject extraction. So you can't just stick it on um, uh, an unergative, for instance, who is laughing. Um, and more importantly, we have this middle construction in Polynesian, which is syntactically intransitive, but notionally transitive. Um, so we have a notional object here in an oblique. And uh, even with extraction of this agent who sailed the canoe, um, we cannot just stick ina on there. So it really cares about the syntax. It cares about the transitive subject, not just an agent. So we have our second generalization. Um, Nukuoro shows syntactic ergativity. And here we have uh, an example, a counterexample to Dixon's generalization. <laughs> 
So now I want to talk a little bit about um, the trouble with identifying abstract alignment. And I want to start this by bringing up uh, something I glossed over in the earlier section, which is that Nukuworo actually shows a surface nominative pattern in relative clauses. Um, where subjects are marked with genitive case. So we see this in 21 with a locative um, or a time relative, um, and that's what this oblique pronoun is doing, so we can ignore that. Um, but here we have an intransitive subject marked with genitive and a transitive subject marked with genitive. And the difference between O and A here is really alienability, and I can talk about that more in the question period if you like. Um, we have the same case marking. Um, and this nominative-like pattern is found across Polynesian, including in morphologically ergative languages, such as Niuean and Tongan. Um, and I argue that this is a, an instance of split ergativity, um, a part of the grammar which shows a nominative alignment in an otherwise ergative language. Um, and following some work by Jessica Kuhn, I'm going to attribute these splits to general constraints on locality and a different underlying structure rather than a different case assignment mechanism. And what this allows us to do is posit a single abstract alignment for a language um, despite construction specific morphology. And this is a classic problem with identifying alignment. So the genitive pattern is really reminiscent of the extended ergative in Mayan, um, where subjects of non-finite clauses take set A agreement, which is typically used for ergatives and possessors. Um, so we see this here in Akatek, where we get the same agreement morpheme for an intransitive subject and a transitive object in an otherwise ergative language. And many analyses of Mayan propose that these clauses are nominalizations, where the overt subject is actually a possessor. And it's this possessor ergative syncretism that, that leads to some confusion. And it's interesting that analyses of Polynesian uh, genitive relative clauses propose almost the same structure where, uh, for relative clauses, where the genitive subject is external to the relative clause and controls an embedded pro subject. So here is where that uh, subject actually is, and it's receiving genitive case up here, and it's controlling a pro in the lower clause. So in Nukuworo, this clause external position is obscured by SVO order, um, but I support it here with two pieces of evidence. Um, first, in cases where we do allow postverbal subjects in intransitive specifically, um, the clearly clause internal subject appears unmarked rather than in genitive case. So we have this difference in 24 between a preverbal subject which receives genitive and a postverbal subject which is unmarked. And second, Nukuworo allows pre-posed genitives and relative clauses. Um, and this is true also of normal possession constructions. Um, and here they are clearly displaced from subject position. So you have something like um, his time that walked um, being interpreted as the time that he walked. So you have a pre-posed genitive here in a structural possessor relationship with time, the relative head, um, but it's being interpreted down here. And the same is true of a transitive um, subject of the relative clause as well. So I argue here that the nominative alignment is really only apparent. Um, we get genitive case assigned clause externally by a functional head in the nominal domain. Um, and then inside the relative clause, abstract ergative and absolutive case are assigned just as in matrix clauses, nothing has changed. Um, and this nominative-like appearance stems from locality conditions on control, um, where control must target the most local DP. So I bring this all up to show that it's very delicate to identify a single alignment for an entire language. Um, so we've seen in this talk different aspects of Nukuoro syntax showing neutral, ergative, and accusative alignments. Um, so we have to be really careful, but I argue that we can still identify abstract alignment. It's still meaningful to do so, um, but we need to look a little bit deeper than morphological marking. We really need to look at clause structure. We need to look at licensing and movement as well. So let's look at our implications. Um, so the first implication obviously is for the typology. Um, Dixon's generalization does not hold entirely. Um, syntactic ergativity is possible without any morphological ergativity. Um, and this fills in the last cell of the typology here. Um, so we have all four cells attested. And crucially, Nukuworo has neutral case marking rather than an overtly nominative one. Um, and this is important for the theory. So 
as I mentioned in the intro, a language like Nukuoro is predicted by theories of syntactic ergativity, assuming that Nukuoro has abstract ergative case that is just not realized. Um, so we don't need to revise the Y model. We don't need to enforce the realization of abstract case. Um, we really have a new type of evidence for abstract case as a distinct phenomenon for morphological case, and particularly here in a language with no overt case marking. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about learnability. Um, so it seems like this pattern is really rare. Um, and I think that it's because it's very difficult to learn or the diachronic pathway um, needs to be a particular way. Um, so the acquisition of categories obviously requires some level of input. Um, and in most languages, case or agreement provides this input to posit abstract case. Um, and here in Nugawara, we see that abstract case was acquired or can be acquired without many phonological case distinctions in the nominal or verbal domain. However, we might hypothesize that given the limited input, um, the pattern of syntactic ergativity might become opaque or unlearnable, um, leading to loss or reanalysis of this pattern. Thank you. Very, very nice talk. Thank you so much. You also kept the time exactly. It's very nice talk. And I opened the discussion. So I just look who has, and you please help me if you see somebody. Yes, Mark Baker has uh, asked the first question. So do you see it? Yes. So um, Mark Baker says, could you say a bit more about the syntactic structure of the ergative extraction construction? Um, it has passive morphology, as I showed, but it didn't look like you were extracting the oblique agent. And the theme argument looked like it was an object position, um, post-verbal, not the subject position, pre-verbal. What am I missing here? This is a really great question. I have no idea currently how the passive is obviating this restriction. Um, so typically, you're right that voice morphology, it tends to be the anti-passive, actually, um, which makes a little bit more sense and, and gels a little bit better with theories of like analyses of syntactic ergativity. Um, I currently don't know. How the passive is doing this. Um, so my, my one thought is that uh, you mentioned here that it didn't look like I was extracting the oblique agent. And you're right, because it doesn't show an oblique pronoun um, when that oblique agent gets extracted for subject extraction. Um, but I think there might be a way that you can play with uh, the nature of that resumptive pronoun as like repairing an island violation, for instance. Um, that it wouldn't show up when you extract the oblique subject. Um, but you're absolutely right that there is something missing there. Um, and that's, that's definitely a subject for future work. So then we have a question by a spectator, you say, to show up, John Beavers, Mitchell, and we have also another, um, yeah, he already formulated or she, and Ksenia Yershova also has asked the question. Maybe you- Yeah, so I see this. Ksenia's uh, question, do you think this data provides counter evidence to case discrimination approaches to syntactic ergativity, uh, e.g. deal? Um, yes. So case discrimination approaches, uh, for instance, like Yuko Otsuka's analysis is of this flavor as well. I think it works really well for an abstract case discrimination approach. So if you say a probe is looking for a particular abstract case feature, works fine. Um, I think what you're referring to is deal 2016, where she kind of plays with the idea that to account for um, Dixon's typology, you need to have morphological case discrimination, um, right? And she does, she does that to, to get the typology. So I think it does provide counter evidence to that morphological case discrimination approach. But if you just reframe it as abstract case discrimination, you get away with it, no problem. The other one was by Mitchell and then John Beavers already asked long time, but maybe he's asked himself, or yes, there is another, I see there are a lot of different sources yeah. where you can look it. So I, I have Mitchell and then I have um, Julie Leggett as well. So Mitchell um, says, I wonder how strong the conclusion is uh, that this necessi necessitates abstract ergative absolutive case distinctions. Could the syntactically ergative extraction restriction be due to purely structural factors rather than extraction being a case discriminating process? Yes, that is a possibility. Um, I think the claim 
you're right that that would kind of weaken the abstract case conclusion. Um, let's say we have object shift for a completely different reason, we could get a syntactically ergative pattern. Um, I think where the, the abstract case really comes in is to account for the new typology. So if we allow, if we have a language like Nuguoro, but we don't have a language that is overtly nominative, um, that then has syntactic ergativity, we can't really say, oh, it's just about structure, right? We predict that we could find that structure regardless of um, case assignment. And if that doesn't seem to be true, um, what I'm arguing here is that the revised typology really depends on syntactic ergativity still being tied to abstract case in some way. Um, but you're right, the, the individual example could be accounted for um, elsewhere. And John Beavers, he has formulated his question already. Yeah. Yes, I wanna respond to Julie's comment in the chat. Yes. Um, so uh, you mentioned an absolutive raising explanation of syntactic ergativity, but that doesn't accord with your SVO word order. Um, yes, that is absolutely true. Um, so, right. So I think for Nukuoro, the SVO word order is really derived. We have some remnants uh, that look like VP remnant movement um, and the object kind of escapes the VP, reminiscent of VP fronting in Samoan. And then on top of that, we get subject movement. Um, so it's really hard to see how that plays with either an object inversion analysis or just like how you derive SVO at all. Um, so I think a case discrimination approach would probably work a little bit better. Um, but if you're someone who plays fast and loose with linear order, um, you could maybe work something out. Yeah. And John Beaver? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, first comment, analyses of ergativity are not always based on case. That's only true in the transformational literature. That's definitely true, um, right? So in LFG, for instance, um, and my data might actually bear on such analyses as well. Thank you. Um, I don't, I'm not really familiar with that literature, so it's something that I definitely have to look into. Um, and then the question, do you think, especially given your learnability point, that this type of alignment system is likely to be transitional? Um, it's what happens when the case system is lost, but the syntax hasn't caught up. Yes, absolutely. So I think that's another reason why this is so rare is that we have a particular diachronic pathway here where we had an ergative language in the morphology and the syntax, uh, and the morphology was lost, uh, most likely due to some contact effects and heavy contact with English. Um, and somehow the syntactic ergativity stuck around. Um, and in, in a case where you lose both, um, you lose both. But yeah, this definitely does seem to be a transitional system. Um, and you just kind of have to pinpoint it at the right moment um, to find a synchronic system like this. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think we, we have only one minute left, so maybe only okay. one question. Sorry for the one that cannot, he can ask maybe or she later. You you have the choice. Xenia already asked one question. Maybe she should yeah. add. You have also this gender so <laughs> I'll say, I'll say something for Ksenia. Ksenia wonders if the Sia Ina isn't a real passive. That's definitely possible um, that it has some other basic function, um, like a transitivizer or something like that. So that's something I have to look uh, look at as well. Um, but then for, for Peter's question, um, how can the abstract ergative case approach account for ergative languages which privilege the ergative for syntactic operations over the absolutive? Um, inversion can't hold. I think uh, that's absolutely true. Um, I am only vaguely familiar with the Rubiana pattern um, from a paper by James Collins and a co-author, um, but right. So this looks more maybe like the subject only restriction common in Austronesian per perhaps, um, but yeah, this, this really would lend to a case discrimination approach where you can just choose um, ergative or absolutive to be privileged. Yeah. So I yeah, would thanks. like to uh, thank you so much, all of you, and especially Emily, for a wonderful talk and also for the discussion. I come to the next talk by Sigwan Tiviersch. She's talking about person and number asymmetries in Georgian agreement. Thank you so much. So, we sh yeah, here you go. You have a little bit more time, one minute, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so is the screen showing for everyone? I see it well. Okay. 
All right, thank you all for coming to my talk today. I'm going to be, so I'm going to be focusing on a little bit of the Georgian agreement uh, system, not the whole thing because it's so complicated, but I'm going to specifically focus into um, uh, some parts where we see person and number asymmetries. So just to start us off, uh, the Georgian agreement system has two major agreement paradigms. There's one that's been called the basic agreement paradigm uh, this is where we have a set of prefixes that mark the object and we have a, have a set of suffixes that mark the subject. And this is in contrast to the um, inverse agreement paradigm where that same set of prefixes now mark the subject and a different set of suffixes mark the object instead. Um, I just, and I just wanna point out uh, before heading further into the talk that these terms inverse, basic and inverse um, and the patterns that we find in those uh, paradigms. They're almost mirror images of each other, but they're not quite. There are a couple of differences and divergences. And two of the big differences that we'll see is that in the inverse compared to the uh, basic first and second person inverse objects, they're marked by these special agreement uh, morphemes. And the other puzzle that we'll focus on has concerns third person plural subjects, where in the inverse, we see that they can be marked by a verbal plural marker uh, to, that we'll see in the following slides that cannot occur with uh, such arguments in the basic. And so these two patterns then form the two main questions of this talk. So for first question, uh, what is responsible for the person specific agreement morphology for first and second person objects in the inverse? And second, what allows the verbal plural marker to mark third plural subjects in the inverse? And I'm gonna argue that the answer to both is tied to the positions of these so-called subjects relative to little b. Um, specifically, in clauses corresponding to the basic agreement paradigm, the subject is base generated higher than little v. And in clauses corresponding to the inverse agreement paradigm, the subject is base generated lower than little v. And this is important because in clauses corresponding to the inverse agreement paradigm, the subject is below little v, yes, but it's also above this, the object. And so in this case, the inverse subject intervenes for licensing from little v. So that forces a first or second person object if present to vacate the little VP for licensing them from a higher position. And this is in contrast to third person objects. Uh, third persons in general, cross-linguistically don't require the same licensing as first or second persons. So in the inverse uh, case that we'll see in more detail, they don't need to move. And so the intervener in that case is little V itself, uh, which is targeted for agreement by the person probe on little V first, on, sorry, on T first. And once that initial agree relation established between T and little v, then a subsequent search by the number probe, which is also on T, uh, finds the third person plural subject and spec apple P. So that was just a, a quick breeze of the talk itself. Uh, so next I'm going to go into a selected overview of the Georgian agreement paradigm and just really pull away some general properties of the basic and inverse agreement paradigms and then zoom into, into more detail, the person and number asymmetries uh, that I just discussed. And then we'll head into an analysis where I'll talk a little bit about the Georgian clausal structure and go into specific derivations of that first and second person asymmetry on the one hand and a third person asymmetry on the other hand. And then there'll be some conclusions and some discussion of further uh, evidence in the question period if we have time. Okay, so just to begin with an overview of the Georgian agreement system. I'm going to abstract away from a lot of uh, specifics and exceptions and just really focus on this uh, verbal template for how Georgian agreement uh, patterns. So first we have a set of perfect, as some examples here, we'll see them in actual data soon. Um, and then we have a set of applicatives that we'll also see in the data, but I won't be focusing on them so much for this talk. And then we have the verb stem, and then we have a suffix, a, suffix, a broad suffix slot um, for suffixes that um, are generally uh, sensitive to tense aspect and mood, and they also encode some information about number. So for the basic agreement uh, paradigm, those person prefixes are object oriented, uh, broadly speaking. And then those uh, time and number suffixes, those are subject agreement um, uh, morphemes. So that's for the basic and then for the inverse agreement paradigm, those same person prefixes now target the subject instead and the time plus number uh, suffixes now they target the object in the inverse. 
And I just want to point out that between the two paradigms, uh, the forms of the person prefixes stay the same, but the forms of the ten plus number suffixes are quite different. So I'll go into more detail about that in the following uh, slides. So it's just first focusing on the person name symmetries that we see with first and second persons. Uh, this uh, in the basic agreement paradigm, as shown in one A through C, first and second person objects they trigger let's call it normal object agreement morphology. So second persons are marked second person objects are marked by the prefix go. First person singular objects are marked by the prefix ma, and first person plural uh, objects are marked by the prefix gv. Uh, and these uh, prefixes go away in the inverse um, paradigm, where, so just looking at the sentences in 2a and 2b, um, we see that first person object in the inverse triggers this um, exceptional agreement morphology, where we have this v um, affix and this to affix, and also this dummy r, which means b. So it triggers this complex form in when they occur, when the first person occurs as an object in the inverse uh, agreement paradigm. And this is the same pattern that we see for second person objects. So I love you and cheers. Uh, he loves you, plural. Uh, we get he marking the second person to if it's plural. And again, this r, dummy r, b on, on the verbal complex. Um, now I just want to note that these prefixes v, h, and h, they do appear in a basic agreement paradigm as well. Uh, they're mostly limited to copular constructions. Uh, h is the most limited of these two. Uh, v appears in a bit in a few more cases, but all that just to say that the distribution of v and h in the inverse, it's not the mirror image of the basic. So there does seem to be some um, fundamental difference between these two agreement paradigms. And so we can characterize this by saying that first and second person arguments trigger exceptional agreement in the inverse paradigm, but only when they appear as objects. Just looking at the sentences in four, we see that when first and person arguments appear as inverse subjects, then they just trigger the person prefixes that we saw from the basic paradigm. So that's the puzzle with first and second persons. And now I want to head into the puzzle for number with number asymmetries concerning third persons. So again, starting from the basic agreement paradigm for point of comparison, looking at the senses in 5 and 5a and 5b, we see that third person plural subjects are marked by a single um, tam sensitive suffix, which marks both person and number. So S in 5a, they invited him or her marks a third person plural subject um, in the aorist, which is usually used to express events in the past. And in 5b, we have N marking a third person plural subject in the present. And crucially, to this uh, verbal plural marker, to cannot appear in these cases, can't mark third person plural subjects in the basic agreement paradigm. Uh, but this is not what we see in the inverse agreement paradigm. We're looking at this sentence in six, they love him or her. We see that third person plural inverse subjects can be marked by to. So this gives us reason to think that to is not um, a plural marker that's just sensitive to first or second persons, it's a general plural marker. But this pattern is only possible when the co-occurring object is third person. Just so looking at seven, when the object is first person or second person, then to cannot mark the third plural subject anymore. It has to mark the object. So this uh, cannot mean they love me, it has to mean they love us. And the sentence in 7b can't mean they love you singular, it has to mean they love you plural. And so this pattern is characterized as this. Uh, third person arguments exceptionally trigger to that verbal plural marker in the inverse agreement paradigm, but only when they are subjects and there's no co-occurring first or second person object. And so these, form the, these puzzles form the, the things to be explained in this project. So first, what is responsible for that exceptional agreement morphology uh, for first and second person objects in the inverse? Right, so why in the basic do we just get uh, these person prefixes when these arguments are objects? And why in the inverse do we get uh, these more complex uh, verb forms? And second, what allows the verbal plural marker to mark third plural subjects in the inverse? Why in the basic can't to mark third plural subjects, but they can in the inverse? 
with this added restriction that the object be third person as well. Okay, so now I'll head into the analysis part of this talk. Uh, for the structure of the Georgian clause, I'm going to adopt the cyclic agree analyses. So these are, this is a family of proposals where the probe first looks down and if the initial search is unsatisfied, it can then look again. And these do, and the work that this does for Georgian in these analyses is that it derives the object preference nature of those person prefixes in the basic agreement paradigm in Georgian. There are also some places where the uh, prefixes uh, target the, the subject instead. And so due to the cyclic nature of cyclic agree, um, it can derive both of those patterns. So using those models, we can derive both paradigms here um, if we just meddle a little bit with the position of the so-called subject. So for the basic, the subject is going to be above little v in the exter uh, canonical external argument position. And then for the inverse, the sub subject is going to be introduced below little v, again, in this canonical experience or applicative argument in spec apple p. So this is shown in 12 for the basic. So we have uh, the subject higher than little v here. And then in 13 for the structure for the inverse, the subject is going to be lower than little v. And this interacts with licensing requirements for first and second persons on one hand versus third persons on the other. So I'm going to adopt something like the person, uh, sorry, the person licensing condition where first and second persons have to be agreed with if there is a licensing probe in the, in the, somewhere in the clause. Um, there are various implementations of this model, but something like this has to hold you know, for Georgian, I think. And so we can capture the, uh, this uh, shared requirement for first and second persons by assuming that they both bear some abstract feature, we call it participant for now. And in Georgian, third person requirements um, are exempt from the person licensing condition. This is uh, typical behavior cross linguistically, though there are some exceptions to it. And we can see these licensing effects independently in the Georgian PCC. So the Georgian has the strong PCC, which bars a first or second person direct object in the presence of an indirect object. And this is, we can see this in 14. So looking at 14a, we have a second person indirect object. Um, it triggers the go prefix and everything's happy here. But then looking at 14b, where the only difference is now we have a, a first person direct object and the string is unacceptable. Uh, there is a way out looking at 14c, where if we take that first person direct object and we wrap it in some kind of reflexive um, that can save the repair to derivation. Um, in the literature, this is known as object camouflage. I won't be talking about that here in this talk, but I do have some discussion about it, of it in the appendix if you're interested. Okay, so now just to uh, head into some specific derivations of the personal licensing asymmetries. So just focusing first on the first and second person one that we saw. So this is, um, so this is shown in 15. Uh, so for the basic, uh, first and second person into arguments are introduced low in the structure. And so in this position, they are the closest accessible goals to little v. And so there's no need for movement in this case because there's always going to be an agree relation here. There's always going to be a licensing relationship. And so for the basic agreement paradigm, that's what's going to derive those object agreement prefixes. But then for the inverse, um, this isn't quite the case that's going to happen. So this is a derivation in 16. Here now we have a um, intervening argument in spec apple p. And so it's this uh, argument here that's going to uh, control agreement from little v and it's going to intervene for licensing from the, um, sorry, uh, the first and second person's um, internal arguments. And then given this intervention effect here, uh, first and second person internal arguments are now unlicensed in their base generated position. And so if they were to remain there, uh, they would not be licensed, which would violate their uh, person licensing requirements. And so they have to move out of license. Uh, they have to move out of the little VP in order to be licensed. And I assume that they move through the an empty uh, spec with the VP position. And, and so it's the licensing of uh, these participant bearing arguments from that higher position, that's what's marked as affixal agreement on this dummy R B. 
Right? And so this is shown in 16 with this added uh, movement step. So this is the licensing remove movement and the higher licensing comes from further up in the structure. And so this is what is responsible for that exceptional agreement, person agreement for first and second person inverse objects. So that was the first puzzle. Uh, and so now moving on to the puzzle concerning third persons. So it's just shown in 17, again, beginning from the basic for the, the point of comparison. Um, as basic subjects, they are introduced as external arguments in speculative VP. And in this position, third persons, they're always accessible to the person and number probes on T. So in this case, the probes are never going to account another goal. Uh, we're just going to get straightforward uh, subject agreement in this case. Okay. And here where the, some differences come about for the inverse uh, case. So looking at 18, here now we have um, a third person internal argument uh, down here. Sorry. Um, yeah. And in this case, uh, third person arguments, they're not subject to the person licensing condition. Uh, so they don't need to vacate the little VP to fulfill any licensing requirements, right? And this is in contrast to the requirements uh, for first and second persons. And so in this uh, case, then, when little V is a target for the per little V is, is going to end up being the closest target for the person probe on, on T. Okay. And so the closest accessible goal for the number probe then is the third person plural experience your argument in spec Apple P. And this is shown in 18, right? And so, so this DP can stay down here low and the intervener in this case, so this is something like they love him or her, sorry. Uh, the intervener in this case for the person probe is little v itself. And there's a matching uh, participant feature here. Uh, there's different ways to formalize uh, this. We can talk more about that. But the idea is that this uh, person probe on T enters an agree relation with, the, with little v itself. And given that the uh, agree relation, now the number probe, which is also on T, can search past uh, little v and target the next closest accessible goal, which is the third plural um, argument in spec Apple P. And this is what uh, gives rise to this exceptional number agreement for third person plural subjects um, in the inverse when the um, internal argument is third person. And so just to quickly wrap up this section, uh, the, we saw that the only fundamental difference between the basic and the inverse was whether the subject was higher than little v or whether it was lower than little v. And what I tried to show is that this first person, first and second person asymmetry uh, derives from, a per, from an intervention effect where um, in the inverse, we have a, an argument there in spec couple P that intervenes between little v and the object. And so as internal arguments, first and second persons are unlicensed in their base generated position. So they need to move higher for licensing. And the third person asymmetry that we saw that also derives from intervention and a little bit of domain expansion. Uh, third person arguments don't need to be licensed. And so when they appear as objects, they don't need to move, they can just stay put. And so what happens instead is that we have an agree relation that's established between the person probe on T and the V. And that opens the search space for the number probe to, to search below little v and target the, the next goal. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, I know that was a little fast, but what I hope to show is that we have, okay, so on one hand we have the basic agreement paradigm and on the other we have the inverse agreement paradigms and they look really close, closely mirror images of each other, but that's not quite the case. There are some interesting diver divergences that we see. And the areas where they do diverge uh, reveals what the underlying mechanisms are of the Georgian agreement system. And they also reveal what the, under, um, what the underlying argument structure must be. And so these were the two questions that I focused on. What is responsible for the person specific agreement morphology for first and second person objects in the inverse? And also what allows the verbal plural marker to mark third plural subjects in the inverse? And so these are the answers that I proposed. So for the first one, I argued that first and second persons are subject to the person licensing condition, which is not met when they are inverse objects to an intervening subject. So that mode uh, triggers this additional movement step that triggers this exceptional um, agreement morphology. And for the second question, 
I argue that third person plural experiences are introduced lower than little v. And so it's little v itself that intervenes for person agreement from T. And so the subsequent number uh, search for number agreement can probe lower than little v and find that third plural experiencer. But this is, can only um, arise in this particular case in the inverse. And the broad uh, general property of this analysis was that it didn't need to appeal to quirks of specific agreement paradigms. It, it doesn't need to build uh, something like the basic agreement paradigm into the system itself or the inverse agreement paradigm into the system itself. And what I hope to that you'll come away with is that we, we, can, we can get to a systematic and comprehensive account of Georgian agreement um, that has minimal innovations and additions to theories of agreement and licensing. It's just intervention, it's just um, licensing. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I found it really very interesting and, and thank you so much for keeping time again. Okay. <laughs> so we're just opening the discussion and uh, are there any questions? I will try to find, uh, yeah. So, see anything? <laughs> Don't see anybody, but... So. Until now, I don't see any. There's one from Mark Baker, sorry. Yes, oh yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes, please. Okay, uh, so would you expect to find syntactic evidence outside from the domain agreement for the hypothesis that subjects can be generated in different positions, some outside root of VP and some inside root of VP? Do you find any such converging evidence? Why or why not do you think outside from the domain agreement? <laughs> Mm. If there is evidence from outside agreement, I haven't found them yet. Um, I've, I've only just started looking at um, uh, word order and other non-agreement things like that. I found some other places, some other evidence for um, inside <laughs> the domain of agreement itself. I have some examples from adversity causatives for example, where we have an empty speculative VP position and uh, the causer is in the same spec Apple P uh, position. And what I found is that whenever you have that particular structural uh, configuration, then we get the same uh, patterns that we find in the inverse. So that seems to be um, a structural thing that we can track with by, by agreement, particularly this to um, suffix. But yeah, my hope is to find the, um, some other evidence too that's not tied to agreement. So thank you for that. Food you for thought. Thank you so much. There is also a question by Hagen Blix. I don't know, could you formulate it or? Yeah, it's already formulated. Very interesting talk. Okay, okay. see it there. Yes. Do you... Sorry? Do you see the request? Yes. First... Yeah, okay, please. Just press the comment. I think the idea of relating the differences between the basic and inverse to the PLC is very interesting. Maybe for over the head laws in some detail. Or the two are actual new images. Yes, last is very interesting with this case. Much better behaved. Uh, modular third plural data, subject string and plural agreement, and style morphemes. And allows does not have PCC effects. Okay. Thanks for that for that comment, Hagen. I'll definitely look into that. So second the question, why is the repair strategy for PLC violations in the inverse movement? Uh, but in diatransitives, it's object camouflage. Yes. So I mentioned I had some slides on that. Um, yes, so I'm assuming that this is all, be, all due to the presence of an external argument in speculative VP or not. <coughs> uh, so it's a bit tricky at this point. Um, so first just, right, so talking about the, the transitives, we have an external argument, argument in spec Apple P, and then we have an argument down low. Um, and because that speculative VP, uh, position is filled in ditransitive, I'm assuming that there's no um, movement that can be triggered uh, there due to the features of like little v itself. So I'm still working about how to formalize that, but it seems to be the case that because that spec little vp position is filled, um, the object is trapped in its base generated position at that case. It can't move. And so object camouflage kind of comes in and saves the day as like the last resort. 
another question by Kevin Kwong. Thank you, Do you need to specify inverse versus direct context? Um, in the vocabulary items for spelling out the agreement for each person. Um, so this is part of a, the larger um, project that I've been working on for the Georgian agreement system as a whole. And I don't need to specify inverse versus direct context. There's some other hoops that I have to jump through. Uh, but no, I don't have to. We can talk about this um, outside of this. Uh, Q and A period. It's, it, it's a lot, but uh, definitely reach out to me if you're curious to see. But all the hoops I had to jump through to get out of saying um, in person direct in the vocabulary items themselves. Sorry, you're muted. I don't know how it happened. Okay, so I will tell you. It doesn't matter. MIT <laughs> is worth enough to say it twice. So Rafael Abramovich from MIT, uh, he's doing his PhD with uh, David Pesetsky, as I've been told. And his uh, topic is deconstructing inverse case attraction. And his uh, languages are uh, bully and Koryak and uh, language families, you, you've seen it as well. So thank you so much for coming and we will listen to your talk. I'm very interested in it as well. Thank you. Thanks. I've just um, sent a link to the handout on Dropbox that you can download if you would like, um, but I'll be sharing my screen here. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so this talk begins from an observation about case marking in Koryak relative clauses. Uh, and we find that two cases can occur on the head of a relative clause. Um, the first, which I'll call the external case, um, is the case assigned by uh, the matrix verb. So in, um, in one, uh, I will not approach the wolf that is howling, uh, approach takes a dative complement and we can get a dative case in the head. But the head can also bear what I'll call internal case. This is the case assigned to the gap inside the relative clause. Um, uh, so in this case, it's absolutive because the gap is an intransitive subject. And this is also fine on the head of the relative clause. Now, there is no um, obvious difference in the surface syntax um, between um, these two um, uh, options. Uh, so the head is to the left of the relative clause in both cases, and the head triggers agreement on the matrix verb in the same way in both cases. So for example, if we have a, a singular subject as in 2A, um, the woman that woke me up sings well, you have singular agreement on the verb, in this case is a lack of plural agreement, but in 2B, the women that woke me up sing well, this is plural, and we get this plural suffix on there. So this phenomenon has been found in a variety of languages and is called um, inverse case attraction. So based on data from Koryak, um, I'll argue that the heads of noun phrases with relative clauses where you see inverse case attraction Abel, could um, you, are in the could you, could you do the presentation a little bit bigger, larger? It's a little bit small. Yes, much better. Thank you so much. Sorry. Much okay, much better. No problem. Um, so, um, right, so uh, when the head of the relative clause has inverse case attraction, um, the head of the relative clause is actually in the left periphery of the relative clause, whereas uh, um, when you don't have inverse case attraction, you have a true externally headed relative clause. 
So all available data literature from other languages with ICA with inverse case attraction either supports or is consistent with my accounts, with my account of the Coriac facts. And I think the result is that um, inverse case attraction is due to a type of relative clause that has mostly or not completely escaped syntactician's attention. These are internally headed relative clauses with left peripheral heads. Um, this type of relative clause is, however, found in the Gur family in West Africa. Um, but the fact that there is no case marking in this family, I think, has led to the, the lack of, of unification of these in the literature. So um, I'll uh, propose that languages with inverse case attraction are just languages that have were like relative clauses that happen to have case marked nouns and relative pronouns. So there are two main um, uh, sort of approaches to inverse case attraction. The majority opinion is that um, relative clause with inverse case attraction are externally headed relative clauses where something extra has happened. So th this can be um, a process of case transmission, according to some people. Others have argued that this is a long distance assignment from inside relative clause. Um, and Deal has argued for Nez Perce that uh, they actually have a different derivational um, history. So what I'll show is that relative clauses with inverse case attraction have their heads inside the relative clause. So the fact so, so they can't be externally headed. Uh, and consequently, the fact that they have internal case is unsurprising. Um, uh, and I'll also test that um, a, a requirement that um, on, on the sort of left peripherality of the noun phrase with um, inverse case attraction um, sort of may, may be due to, to different things in different languages. The minority view is that these are actually correlatives. So the head bearing internal case and the relative pronoun are both inside a, a correlative CP and that is left to join to the main clause. And I'll argue that just like on a variety of, uh, of tests, um, uh, relative clauses with inverse case attraction simply don't pattern like correlatives. So um, I'll argue against both of these analyses in turn based on, on data from Koryak. Um, quickly, Koryak is a Chukotka Kamchatkan language spoken um, in and around northern Kamchatka with possibly 700 across dialects, uh, across all dialects. This work is on the uh, Chauchavan dialect. So uh, um, there are two crucial differences between um, relative clauses with and without inverse case attraction that I think uh, argue against um, an externally headed analysis. Um, the first is that relative clause extraposition is forbidden if the head has inverse case attraction, but allowed otherwise. And the second is that scrambling of relative clause internal material is allowed if the head has inverse case attraction, but is uh, disallowed otherwise. So let's start with extraposition. Um, we see from 3A that um, if you have that sort of when the, the, head, the, the relative clause is not extraposed from the head, so we have, we have the girl that I gave candies to is laughing at me, both the external and or the external ergative and the internal dative um, are allowed. But once we extrapose the relative clause, so the girl is laughing at me that I gave candies to, only the internal ergative is allowed and the um, sorry, uh, only the external um, ergative is allowed and the internal dative um, is not allowed. Four shows the same thing with um, ergative and, and narrative case. Um, what this suggests is a tighter relationship between the head and the relative clause in cases of inverse case attraction um, than otherwise. And I think the scrambling facts show exactly what that relationship is. So crucially only in cases of inverse case attraction can relative clause internal material scramble across the head. So um, these sentences are maybe a little bit di uh, difficult to parse. So 5A means tomorrow I will see the woman that scolded me yesterday. And we have yesterday, a relative clause internal adverb that precedes the head of, of the relative clause. Um, but crucially in this case, only if it has the internal case, not if it has the case that is assigned from outside the relative clause. Um, and 5B shows um, the same thing um, with a locative prepositional phrase. So since the pre can only be interpreted inside the relative clause if there is inverse case attraction, what this shows is that the head is actually inside the relative clause uh, when you have inverse case attraction and not inside the relative clause, so X to it when there are no inverse case attraction. So what this suggests is that um, relative clauses with um, 
inverse case attraction cannot be externally headed relative clauses because their head is inside the relative clause. Um, these are not in situ internally headed relative clauses because the head needs to precede the relative pronoun, um, but these are internally headed with where the head is in the left periphery. And the sort of the extra facts will sort of fall out automatically from this because you can't extrapose a relative clause from its head if the head is actually inside the relative clause. I'll now argue against the correlation. Um, there are at least five differences between relative clauses with inverse case attraction and, and correlatives. Some of these are in the appendix, um, but the, the ones that I'll, I'll talk about now are the fact that uh, evidence from coordination um, suggests that the category of a relative clause with inverse case attraction is, is nominal rather than clausal as we would expect for a, um, uh, for a correlative. The fact that the relative clause can be stacked and coordinated when the head has inverse case attraction and the fact that associate the, the, the relative clause with inverse case, the noun phrase containing a relative clause with inverse case attraction with a numeral in the main clause, which is also not a property of correlatives. So the coordination test is simplest. Um, correlatives are, are clausal, and so they should not be able to be coordinated with noun phrases. But uh, a noun phrase with inverse case attraction, uh, a noun phrase containing a relative clause where the head has inverse case attraction can be coordinated um, just with another normal noun phrase. So in six, we have, I saw my mom and the teacher who gave me a bad me. Uh, so we have mom and a bad grade, it, regardless of we have the uh, external absolutive case or the, ex the internal ergative case on the head of the relative clause, these are both fine. Um, 6B shows the, uh, the matrix case is as opposed to ergative. Um, so the coordination test suggests that, that which the noun phrases we have a relative clause uh, correlatives, which are colossal. Um, correlatives also admit neither of the relative clause, whereas um, relative clauses, um, you know, in the right language per can permit both. So we find that you can get stacking and coordination, um, permit this should be stacking and coordination, not stacking nor coordination, uh, of the relative clause in Coriac. So seven has an example. I ate that you added salt to tasty. So from tasty, the external case here is absolutive. We can say this is fine. We can also get the internal um, ergative case from the, uh, the first um, relative clause. This is equally good. This is not predicted if we have here a correlative structure. Likewise, we can coordinate the relative clause. Um, so we can say the person who I approached and who I gave candies to lived uh, um, so coordination and stacking relative clauses is not a property of, of correlatives, but is a property of, of, relative, of normal relative clauses. And here we see again that in cases of inverse case attraction, the behavior is like that of a relative clause. Um, finally, we uh, allow uh, association with index. Um, uh, so cross-linguistically, Relatives need to be associated with a demonstrative or a pronoun in the main clause. So consider the, the Hindi um, correlative in nine, uh, literally which boy uh, will give the correct answer. Um, uh, he will get a good grade. Now this, this pronoun is sort of uh, you know, needed here and uh, what you cannot have in its place is an indefinite like a numeral. So it is not correct in Hindi. So the sort of which answer for will get a good out and this is out as we see in 10b. But our um, who says uh, two people that I gave candies to, um, the head of the rel does can have the internal case. And this is totally fine. Uh, likewise, I will give candy to four of the women uh, who praised me. We can again have the internal ergative case here. Um, so these tests, um, noun phrases with uh, inverse case attraction do not pattern like correlative. 
like uh, Donald, um, uh, I see there is some uh, lagging. Uh, so, so um, uh, where you have ice uh, fraction on the head pattern, neither like externally headed relative clauses nor in may I ask some headed relative. May I ask something, but, Rafa? I don't like to interrupt you, but we have problems with the sound of your. I don't know how we can change it, but uh, I also uh, cannot hardly follow your words. It's really interrupted partly. Is there any storm in, in Boston or whatever? I don't know how we can change it. No, there is not. A, uh, Always. Uh, in I, I saw. Just wonder what it is. I, yeah, we, I got a notification from Zoom that. Yeah. There is a connection. Yeah. So we, we yeah. just go. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting you. I just wanted to. Yeah, maybe. Okay, thank you. Go on. It's okay. No, I understand. Yeah. Um, so um, it looks like uh, when you have inverse case attraction, what is involved is um, turn off my video and it might clear up. Uh -huh. um, okay. Uh, maybe maybe this will maybe this will work. Um, so what we have is a, a type of relative clause where the head is in the left periphery of the relative clause, um, but not so high that the other relative clause internal material um, can't scramble um, can't can't scramble past it. Um, okay. So my analysis is sort of follows directly um, from what I've said. Um, you know. When you have inverse case attraction, the head is pronounced in the left periphery of the relative clause, unlike when you don't have uh, inverse case attraction. Um, and the extraposition facts fall out directly from this, since the target of extraposition actually contains the, the head. Um, and it turns out that the head only at first looks to be in the same position, regardless of inverse case attraction, because it's at the edge of the relative clause. Um, only the scrambling data allows us to see that when you have inverse case attraction, the head is somewhat lower than it is um, when you have external case marking. Since these are not correlatives, relative clauses with inverse case attraction have nominal material above the relative CP. That's also a component of my analysis. Um, and um, I, I'll assume that the head of the relative clause with inverse case attraction needs to move into a specifier into the specifier of a CP, and that the relative pronoun moves into a specifier of a lower CP. We, um, I'll just sort of assume that for now, but we can uh, you can ask about that in, in the question period. Uh, and consequently, I adopt a multiple CP structure based on Ricci's split comp hypothesis. So let's consider um, the structure of. Um, of uh, the two relative uh, clauses in um, 13. So we have, um, I gave candy to the woman that scolded you and um, you can get either uh, dative or um, ergative on the head of the relative clause. Um, if uh, we have the external uh, case marking as in 14, uh, we have the whole, uh, uh, you know, noun phrase moves from the its base position in the specifier little v to the specifier of a of a, of a CP, and then the head excorporates. Uh, well, either 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 excorporates or this is generated with an empty category. I don't. Um, I sort of am agnostic about um, raising versus matching. And the the head of the relative clause woman is outside the higher CP, um, and you know. It, otherwise, everything is is normal. When we do have inverse case attraction, um, the whole noun phrase um, st starts out the same way, but this time, you know, definitely containing the the NP head. Um, this moves with the relative pronoun to one of the CPs, and then the head excorporates and moves to a higher CP, but does not end up outside the relative clause. Uh, and then, when relative clause internal material scrambles across the head. Um, in this case, the structure is as in 16, 
So the same thing we saw before, which woman or you know, woman who literally moves into the first CP, um, then the head excorporates, and then you know one of the um, you know an adjunct can then just move into a, an even higher CP, presumably for some information structural reasons. So something I haven't said much about yet is what the relationship um, of the, the noun phrase with the relative clause is to the rest of the clause that it occurs in. And so one fact about the, these is that they must be in the left periphery. So we see, for example, in 17, that the realis negation particle can only precede the whole relative clause if you have external case. If you have the internal ergative case on the head, uh, you cannot have the uine uh, preceding it. Um, 17b shows the same thing. You can't have a pronoun preceding a relative clause with, in, with uh, inverse case attraction, but you can have normal case. And 17c shows that you can't have you know, something else there. Now, it does not have to be immediately clause initial though. So um, some speakers allow wh adjuncts like when, um, why can also be allowed in this position um, with inverse case attraction. Uh, and other speakers also allow the, uh, some speakers also allow the irrealis high negation particle qayyim to precede um, the whole thing um, with um, inverse case attraction. So there is a position sort of in the, in the left of the clause where this must be, but at least for some speakers, it is not the clause initial um, position. Um, so we might wonder how this noun phrase with inverse case direction gets to the left periphery of the clause. And at least for some speakers, it looks like this is movement. So, you know, Koryak, given that it's a free word order language, we, we have to be able to posit various movements to move non-interrogative elements um, around in the clause. Um, deriving this by movement also prevents us from having to posit a specific type of high base generation that only applies in cases of inverse case attraction. And for some speakers, the displacement, the, the sort of left peripheral position um, of the noun phrase with the relative clause is in fact island bound. So in 19, we see that Koryak has sort of relatively standard WH islands. Um, so you cannot say, what do you know why Ilmato gave to me? Uh, and likewise, uh, some speakers do not like a sentence like, I know why the person that scolded you gave you candy where the, the um, the relative clause has moved um, sort of outside this island. So then we can ask, what about the speakers who find 19b okay? So I think I'll have to concede that perhaps some, but not all speakers allow a, a sort of high base generation of this noun phrase. I think the takeaway here is that, you know, even within Koryak, there is variation regarding how um, this noun phrase with a relative clause with inverse case attraction gets into the left periphery, as well as what exactly that um, left peripheral position is and a cross-linguistic look at the licensing conditions uh, on relative clauses with respect to um, you know, whether they have to be all the way at the left, somewhere near the left, or just anywhere, I think shows that this left side requirement needs to be accounted for on a language particular basis. Um, this has been done for, for Nez Perce, but to my knowledge, um, not really for, for any other language with inverse case attraction. Um, so I think more work needs to be done specifically on correct to understand what's going on here. I'll um, briefly uh, mention um, some data from, from Gur. So we might be skeptical about the existence of this, the type of relative clause that I've, that I've discussed here. So um, internally headed, but with the head in the left periphery, but exactly this kind of relative clause is found throughout the Gur languages. I'll um, just briefly mention um, some, uh, some data from Bully that sort of follows exactly uh, the Koryak pattern. So um, in, in Bully, if we look at 21b, if you want to say something like a team ate the mango that Amuak uh, bought yesterday, Bully allows an XC2 um, relative clause strategy. Um, but we can tell that this is not um, completely, ex this is not externally headed because a relative clause internal adverb can precede the head, which is exactly what we saw um, for Koryak. Um, so there is more argumentation about this in one of the um, appendices, but I think the takeaway is that the same syntax that generates this type of relative clause in Gur is responsible for inverse case attraction in Koryak. Um, I think for reasons of time, I'll skip the discussion of other languages, but uh, here I essentially uh, 
list some uh, uh, a variety of languages, um, most mainly Indo-European and Uralic, that seem to show very similar that show very similar effects to what we saw in Koryak. So what I've argued for then is a is a syntax of inverse case attraction, whereby in cases of inverse case attraction, the head of a relative clause is not external to the relative clause, but left peripheral inside it. And this analysis allows us to capture sort of this intuition from the previous literature that um, inverse case attraction constructs a sort of intermediate between correlatives and externally headed relative clauses. So the correlative like word or properties are because like in correlatives, the head with inverse case attraction is inside the relative clause. The externally headed like word or properties are because the head is in the left periphery, but just not completely out of it. The fact that these are not interpreted like correlatives is that they just aren't correlatives. And they're, um, the fact that they're, they're syntactic properties that sort of mirror externally headed relative clauses come from the fact that there is a, a DP above the relative CP. And then I've, I've proposed unifying um, inverse case uh, attraction constructions with the left headed relative clauses of Guru languages, which have no overt case marking which is good because it obviates the need to posit any special mechanisms to account for inverse case attraction. And so on this view, languages inverse case attraction are simply languages with guru like relative clauses that happen to have case mark nouns and relative pronouns. Thanks. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk, Raphael. And I would like uh, to ask people to just ask questions. We have, of course, enough time now, 10 minutes until half past and I would like uh, to thank all of you before we start the discussion for the wonderful talks. For me, it's not the last session which I chair, but one of the last sessions. And I really think this was a wonderful session that we had all speakers, all papers were really brilliant. And a lot of people here discussing, they also, uh, said the same what I say now. So please ask questions. And I would uh, suggest, Abra uh, Raphael, you can maybe uh, take over and just look with me because perhaps I missed the yeah. missed questions. Okay. So the first, so at first there is a, a comment from, from Mark Baker. Um, it seems a bit misleading or confusing to call this construction internally headed relative clause. The head is external to the relative clause TP. Um, after all, do canonical internally headed relative clauses ever have relative pronouns? Um, so uh, not that um, I, being Mark Baker, know of uh, offhand. Um, I also don't know. Um, yeah, I, I suppose m maybe it is misleading. I guess I've tried to um, uh, make sure that what I mean here is sort of XC2 um, internally, uh, internally headed. Um, relative clauses. Um, I think one, I guess I'm not sure what counts as a canonical internally headed relative clause, um, but if we look at the Boolean example um, in 21a, so Boolean allows both uh, sort of the, the left headed internally headed relative clauses and something more like a canonical um, um, internally headed relative clause. And here you do see this relative, this relative suffix t which perhaps is a pronoun. I'm, I'm sort of not, I'm not exactly sure, but that, that might be one example of this. Um, but otherwise, um, I am sort of not aware of, um, of uh, more standard internally headed relative clauses um, that have relative pronouns. But, but sort of your point is well taken that I should perhaps be more careful to uh, um, uh, sort of make sure to call these XC2 internally headed. Um, the, the reason I'm just saying internally is that it's still inside the relative clause. Thanks. Actually, you responded already by language, human languages. Yes. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm not uh, sure about also the, the examples from Quechua and Quechua languages that I've seen do not have relative pronouns. I'm not sure about human, but I can take a look. I also think Japanese doesn't have this. Yeah, this what I wanted to ask if I may. Um, I yep. did Japanese and I just wonder whether the particles that you, kind of particles that you have in the end of a, as we know, Japanese is SOV um, language. And there is in addition after the uh, verb, there, there, there's, there's, there seem to be particles which can introduce a relative clause, different kinds of relative clause, depending on the particle that is introduced. So 
would it be somehow different from that? I don't know if you know Japanese, but this is very interesting, you know, because usually one thinks this is dead and the hyperb, the finite verb is in the end, nothing else comes, but in it's not the case. It's, you know, you have a lot of particles which introduce silently, so to say, different kind of clauses, uh, even model clauses and so on, temporal clauses, different kind of relative clauses. I don't know if it fits to this scenario, but yeah. Sorry, could you explain again? I, I didn't quite understand what you were Some kind um, of what you were saying. finite verb in the end, as always in Japanese, mm -hmm. but you can have an additional particle which introduces a, a complementizer phrase, different kind of complementizer phrases. And I just wonder whether it fits to this uh, example that you have with mango tea, port mango tea, but this is a normal restrictive DP or whatever it is, yes, so relative clause which uh, refers to the mango, yeah. But in this case, in Japanese, mm -hmm. you can have it for any kind of relative clauses, different kind of particles introduce them. I see. Um, I would have to look into that more closely. I'm not sure, but you maybe we can. We don't discuss it now, but I can give you some examples of the sentences that I have in my mind, on my mind, yeah? That would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for your talk. So, other questions? I. I just wondered because sometimes, you know, this language that you have uh, investigated in detail uh, serves sometimes as a, as a, as a, it's a different kind of question that I have now. It's about actually uh, the arguments that you use for, if you have a contact language like Russian and you have this language and whether there is uh, any influence in this respect, which is really very, when some, it really looks really some kind of new for me, this kind of relative clauses. Is there any influence, uh, mutual influence between the languages that surround? Um, I am not sure. Um, Koryak speakers, when they speak Russian, will sometimes produce yeah. inverse case attraction, even yeah. though this is not allowed. And this is ungrammatical in standard yeah. Russian. Uh, um, what may be worth um, sort of thinking about is that, you know, even though these seem to be um, inverse case extraction is quite natural in Koryak. In fact, consultants, like if I ask that, if I give them a sentence which does not have inverse case attraction mm -hmm. and the relative clause at the beginning of the sentence, they will often just repeat it with inverse case attraction. Um, it so it's sort of quite a default way to express this. Um, perhaps interestingly, I have never found it in any texts inverse case attraction um, anywhere. Um, so even in texts that were written by people who like spoke very poor Russian, um, well, actually I take that back. Even in texts that were written by people who had sort of no exposure to Russian until maybe their teens or something, um, you don't find anywhere examples of inverse case attraction. Um, that that could be a sort of sort of literary, a sort of influence of this on, on sort of the Koryak literary language that they were trying to construct. But other than that, I haven't seen any sort of influence between uh, on this between Koryak and Russian. Very, very interesting. I suggest we are now about what time is it in your place? Maybe people are hungry because nobody's asking questions. Such an interesting talk. If not, there you can still, of course, ask and have exchange after this session. In this case, I would just say thank you so much to all speakers, to all discussants, and to all people who asked questions and who were here. I think it was a brilliant, I would put it in the words of Chomsky, a very intriguing analysis that you gave, <laughs> which is always positive when you say something like that. And thank you so much, having so many interesting languages, which are important not only because there are languages, but because there are people behind that, and those people are my mostly endangered languages, which is another issue, but very nice. Thank you so much to all people who participated here in this session. Thank you for giving me the trust and the credit to share. I hope that I didn't do it too bad. I am 65, so I have always an excuse. Have a nice time in USA.
and stay free and of any disease, including the diseases that sometimes come from politics. So I have to say this. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> have a nice time. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Raphael, Emily, Sigwan, all people, Mark. Nice to see you. I don't see you, but I feel you. Thank you so much. It's a long time ago I was in Radkas. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I will close it, or who is it who is closing it? Please, uh, huh? I'll I, close, yeah, I'll close the meeting um, and then I'll reopen it for the next session. Okay. Thanks, guys. Great talks. Already? May I go? Bye bye. <laughs>